How you doing, Sophia? What are you What are you doing here? Isn't this a guitar practice? Oh, it's we're. Oh, this you spoke. We listen. Oh, okay. I knew there's a reason I was supposed to be here. Well, hey everybody. Post pandemic, Dan here. Um, I'm still trying to figure out where I'm supposed to be again, but. I'm here to talk to you about our You Spoke, We Listen session that we do every now and then when we are ready to tell you what we were able to implement based on suggestions that you've given to us over the past year or so. And so A, you wanted somebody besides me to start giving presentations. Less work for me. So now you'll be able to see Michael Hartke, Adam Reynolds, Sean Waugh, and other people from the company delivering content as part of our education program. The second thing is, is that you wanted to have shorter movies. And, and one of my clients put it this way, hey, keep the drill downs coming. There's nothing wrong with the one hour presentations, but can you give us something that we can show in our committee meetings? And so the last movie that I did that I was involved in was on insurance review for your incident response plan. And it was only eight minutes long. So I think we're delivering on that. You're seeing some short movies out there. Finally, several of our clients came to us and said, hey, you know, the movies.infotext.com page is great because there's so many movies on them, but there, there's no method to the madness. They're just kind of a hodgepodge of movies about various subjects. Can you organize them? Well, they actually are organized. They're in chronological order, and we want to keep that going because we want you to know how old the, the information is that we're providing. So. What we did do, though, is we created playlists.infotext.com, which organize our movies based on what type of process they belong to. So the access management movies are all in one place, the risk management movies in another, the you know, strategic planning in another, vendor management in another. And so check out playlists.infotext.com, especially if you have one of those entry-level employees who are saying, yeah, sure, I'd be interested in taking on vendor management, right, right? Because you could send them the playlist on infotext.com and say, hey, watch the dozen or so movies that are in the vendor management playlist there and then come back and talk to me about taking on vendor management. Thank you. I do think I have a guitar practice later today and I, as you can tell, I need to work a little bit on my Neil Young, so back to that, I guess. <laughs> Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Michael Arkey, and I'm the moderator for our live webinars. This is the first part of a two-part series. Today, we will be discussing the impact of the AIO on technology planning, and in our normal planning webinar in November, we'll be putting that to work as you endeavor on writing your first architecture plan. Which brings me to this main speaker for today's event. Drum roll, please. Please allow me to introduce the man with 13 letters after his name, the cyber changeling from Chicago, the guy who drives all the way home without stopping at one stoplight, the awareness guru from Indiana, and probably the only one among us here today who is actually has a degree in architecture. You guessed it, Dan Hathaway. Dan? Thank you, Mike. Um, and welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us today in our webinar. Um, just so you know, we'll probably be cutting a lot of that out when we get to the movie. But um, we are kind of rusty at live webinars. Uh, we've been doing movies for a while here. Our technology planning webinar is always a live webinar. And I think we've only done one or two in between last year's technology planning webinar and this year. Um, and, and this, by the way, is, is what it usually looks like. We we usually talk about uh, uh, technology planning in light of the design process. And so, um, and then the other part about our live webinars is that we traditionally always have a shout out. And so today my shout out is actually gonna go to the panelists at the webinar. We've got Regina, Christine, actually she goes by Chris, uh, Michael, Adam, um, and myself. We'll be having a discussion 
about how uh, the AIO guidance impacts technology planning in a small community-based bank. Uh, well, I'm really looking forward to the discussion because what we what we kept telling Regina and Chris over and over again, they're bankers, so they want to be prepared, right? But we kept saying we'd really rather you not be prepared because we want to really kind of catch your initial reaction to this 165-page uh, guidance. This banner here means that I'm showing you what's directly in the guidance, and you're going to see this banner way too much. I, you know, we've learned that hey, the more guidance you put in your webinar, you know, the less excited people are about the webinar. Uh, but obviously, since this webinar is about a guidance, you're going to see that a lot. Um, and then secondly, we do have a lot of deliverables. Um, you might want to go ahead and try to get out there now to make sure you can get out to my.infotex.com/october2021. Uh, mainly because of the fact that uh, you're going to see a zip file that has all of these deliverables in it, um, starting with a guidance summary. And so what we do whenever there's an update to a guidance or a new guidance released, uh, we actually go out and review the guidance and try to summarize it. Now, usually our guidance summaries are about two to three pages long. This one is six pages long, I believe, or yeah, six pages long. Um, and, and, you know, it doesn't have everything in the guidance, but if you read through this guidance summary, it should really bring you up to speed about what's changed and that sort of thing. Um, the last thing in the book, well, we actually have the work program. That's, that is an audit checklist that your examiners will be bringing into your bank. I'll be talking about that briefly in a few minutes. But we also have in here the FFIEC um, uh, guidance itself. And, and a lot of people always ask, why do you actually give us the PDF of the guidance? We can, you know, we can go online and get that guidance. And, and, and they're right. This whole guidance is online. But one of the things that I love about the PDFs is they're searchable. And so, you know, I mean, and, and you can search on the, you know, on the FFIC's website, but, you know, it's not as simple. It's not as easy as searching the guidance. Like, say, for example, if we wanted to search for the word uh, shadow IT or just shadow, you know, I can see it's in there 46 times, right? You can't do that on the internet. So that's the reason why I feel like you might want to have the booklet. So it's in that zip file. We've got the, the, the zero trust guidance in there as well. Um, this one right here, we might, if we can find the time, if I'm doing good on time, we might walk through this a little more uh, than what I've shown so far as I've gone through workshops and stuff, but there's 18 gray areas in the guidance. Before your next audit, before your next examination, you should read this and get your arms around whether you're a smaller, less complex entity. Um, how do we define that? That's the, you know gonna be where the rubber meets the road, in my opinion, uh, in a lot of the conversations that our auditors have with, their, um, uh, with our, our, our banks that we're auditing. Um, and then finally, I have these checklists, uh, and 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 just so you know, we had uh, we just grabbed the deliverables from a different. So this is this really doesn't pertain to the AIO. It's just the gaps that the uh, cyber uh, security assessment tool has in it when you compare it to the CIS Top 20. Um, it's a very interesting document. It's kind of a frightening document if you've been relying solely on the CAT to 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 arrive at some kind of a confidence in your in your cyber security. Um, but the only reason it's in there is because it was in another presentation and I didn't uh, have the time, quite frankly, to, to look at this closely and, and remove this stuff. And so likewise, these are uh, audit check. These are just checklists we use to audit our clients. They're in there. They don't really pertain much uh, to the AIO guidance. But this checklist here, we're going to kind of go uh, and talk about a little bit more later. Um, it's a very important uh, document, in my opinion, because it can be used to help you get your arms around the to-dos that might arise out of this guidance if you want to get out in it, you know, you know, get out ahead of your auditors and examiners, which we always say is an important best practice because if you already have processes and procedures in place that are working, the auditors and examiners aren't going to interpret the guidance for you. Is our it's our theory on it. And I'm not saying that theory always works, but it's it's our theory on it. So um those are the main documents that are in there. Uh, I, I want to keep the webinar going. Uh, we're actually uh, tipping this, our normal webinars upside down because usually uh, we'll go over the guidance and then, you know, we'll, we'll show you the deliverables. This time I actually started with the deliverables. Uh, so we're actually on the part two of the webinar.
uh, which is the guidance itself. And so suffice it to say that the FFIEC um, has updated and really kind of tossed out the 2004 operations booklet, which I always think is a good idea. You know, what the heck, you know, uh, uh, technology changes on a regular basis. So, you know, we, we want banks to, to update their policies annually. And by the way, we're going to update our policies once every 15 years or so. Right. That's kind of the way they uh, led by example. Um, and so thus, you know, of course, it's going to go from 53 pages to 164 pages because a lot's happened since 2004, in my opinion. Um, this is the uh, part of the presentation where I have to be careful what I say, because I always get really irritated when I see this in a guidance that is updating something from 2004. I'm sorry, but there are new things in this guidance. A lot of people are telling me, ah, I think we're probably already there because we've been getting audited well and stuff. Um, there are some new things. That's what this webinar really is going to be about. But if you look here, uh, one of the things that, you know, they're talking about is, is you know, an architecture plan. If you look at what they say is new, they say they've updated their the information on architecture. Uh, but we you know, um, you have to kind of search a lot using that nice, wonderful search features of the uh, uh, Adobe Reader uh, to find anything about architecture in there. Uh, whereas the new guidance is, is all about architecture and architecture planning and making sure that we can uh, uh, safely uh, modify our infrastructure to where it needs to be uh, because, and this is my opinion, by the way, I should probably take this banner out here, but because to me, uh, we need to be at whatever zero trust evolves to be um, if we're going to be safe using, you know, 2020s uh, technology. And, and that's really, to me, the, the main takeaway. And, and if you came to our July 29th workshop at the Indiana Bankers Association, um, you heard me complaining a lot about this guidance. I, I presented this guidance more from the perspective of, wow, there's a lot of work in here. Um, I have gone through it enough to know that there is not as much work uh, for the smaller community-based banks, um, and it does really lay out and establish a map that we can use, or a method we can use, really, to map uh, major changes in our infrastructure. And so, the first thing that I think is new, I kind of liked it as a purveyor of boilerplates. Uh, we've had job description boilerplates out there for years. I, I'll have to be honest with you. We've never had a chief architect or a chief data officer. Um, we've never even had an IT operations manager. But it's nice that we can now, and we haven't found a time to do it yet, but we can go in and update our boilerplates to make sure they're complying with the, the roles the way the FFIEC sees them. So that was kind of nice for us. Um, and, and really for you, I mean, you might want to take a look at the, the, if you do have job descriptions for any of these positions, uh, because that can kind of help you get a feel for maybe where you have some gaps in terms of, of, of everybody's normal regular duties. Um, if you're on LinkedIn, and my team should be proud that I'm getting on LinkedIn more often, they're wanting me to do that now. Um, and quite frankly, just so you know, there's a lot of great education material on LinkedIn. Uh, but you might have seen this when the AIO guidance was uh, first released, where, where because people can search that PDF, um, you know, they saw the word device in there 46 times. Actually, um, you know, device is in the word devices, which is in there 158 times. So I'm not exactly sure how that worked out. But that is something that, you know, I mean, came up in LinkedIn. Um, to me, the real metric that I didn't see until I posted it on LinkedIn, you know, which you know, I'm brand new on LinkedIn, so hardly anybody saw it, right? But um, the real metric is this one, that 18 times it used the words smaller, less complex entities may or will or whatever. Um, and so we want to take a look at that and make sure that we know whether we're a smaller, or less complex entity and be ready to discuss that um, when it gets to the next audit or, or examination. That includes the AIO guidance. And so let's just kind of jump out there real quick, just to kind of show you where it is. So, you know, and, you know, just to kind of confirm in my mind that, yes, it's there. All right. And so I'm just going to bring up, I'm just going to pick a number of random, say a nine. Uh, management should also consider IT assets that do not fall into traditional hardware or software inventory, such as internet access, websites owned, certificates employed, blah, blah, blah. Smaller or less complex entities may have one comprehensive inventory that contains all of its technology assets. Um, that's an example of what we mean there. 
so moving beyond you know the metrics of the guidance to me one of the first big things in my opinion because to me policies but at this late stage of the game are are huge if we need to make a policy change in 2021 well something must have changed between 2004 and 2021 you know and so for the smaller banks really i feel like you just need to get some language that will go into an existing information security program or risk management policy it governance policy whatever you know uh your top level um uh, it policy that the board approves that includes your existing policies about technology planning there should be language in there uh requiring what you know the aio is wanting in policy language and and by the way we're working up boilerplate language uh for that uh that'll be in that webinar that we're uh coming up with in um november uh back to what's new though uh, you know, it, it used to just be operations. So now we're talking architecture and infrastructure. Um, those of you who are sitting there thinking, well, wait a minute, the beginning of it says nothing's new. You know, I brought that up and I said, that's so FFIEC that they're saying it's nothing's new. Um, well, you know, one of the things that you didn't have to do before, which is now required, um, is an architecture plan. And uh, I tried to see if we can get out of it. You know, I tried to see, well, does it say smaller, less complex entities? Um, and by the way, smaller, less complex entities do not have to uh, put together an enterprise architecture, uh, which is, you know, for large, huge banks. Um, but you do have to pull together an architecture plan. And so I, I noticed Mike, when he introduced me, said I'm probably the only one amongst us with an architecture degree. Um, I actually got it in 1982. Interest rates at that time were what the day I graduated. I was told that interest rates are 19%. Here, sign up for your master's degree. Uh, I decided to become a business person instead. The rest is history. But the point being is that we're not going to be able to, you know, design an architecture plan without using design principles where, you know, we we define the problem, we we analyze the problem, we generate alternatives, we then select from those alternatives and then we present those alternatives in some kind of a format. Does if, if this is sounding like uh, the webinar that we normally do in October, our technology planning webinar where we talk about design principles, yes it is exactly like that we're just focusing those principles on your infrastructure and how the whole architecture of your information systems which includes your network infrastructure but it also includes your websites and in those you know uh, destinations on the internet where may, maybe there's risk maybe there's not um so to me instead of t-squares and rulers you're really going to need to pull out the technology planning tools you've already been using i'm here to tell you that you're going to want to start working on your asset inventory and even though it says smaller less complex entities um, can use one large inventory auditors are still going to want to make sure that your inventory in the websites and trying to really differentiate between those which have you know mfa and, with, and those which don't if we're putting sensitive information out there you know that sort of thing which i'll talk about that in a little bit because i feel like they've missed an opportunity there um and then i feel like you need to bring the zero trust publication to bear here because to me one of the main reasons why an architecture plan is a good idea now is because there's daunting daunting tasks that aren't really tasks they're overall strategy strategic objectives that need to be addressed if we're going to get from the belief that networks should be secured because there's a firewall and there's a moat around our castle to the fact that hey we now live in a hotel people are checking in and out of our network constantly so how are we going to get from one you know paradigm to the other well our architecture plan can articulate that um, so moving on then uh, cloud computing really is a great example of the types of issues that can be addressed in your architecture plan quite frankly if you look here they've got a list of all the evolving technologies right um, and so how does our architecture plan address cloud computing 
How does it address microservices? How does it blow up? And, and some of you might not even know what we mean by microservices and the AIO defines them. And so don't take what I'm gonna say now, but to me, bill pay, most of you, you know, when you were setting up your internet banking and were using, uh, you know, was it check free or something like that, you know, for a bill pay, that was actually a microservice. It was an application that worked with your core processor. So as you can tell, you're using a lot of microservices now we want to inventory them. We want to plan out how they're going to evolve over time, that sort of thing. Um, but back to the architecture plan. This is really what it says. You'll you know see that it does you know talk about smaller, less complex entities may have a less structured architecture plan and generally have fewer initiatives. Um, but again, if we're going to get to zero trust, which to me and and by the way. The way we define zero trust today is going to be completely different than the way we define it in five years. Remember when portable devices, if you're old enough to remember when, you know, in 2007, you know, the people started using smartphones and such, you know, and 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 the way we define portable device security in 2008 was completely different than the way we define it now. Um, and that's what we're talking about. Zero trust is going to evolve over time, but we need to start. It's a huge change. We need to start looking at how we're going to evolve our architecture to uh, to fit in with zero trust. Uh, but they did. They they you know we we've been arguing with various you know audit clients. Not arguing, but we've been having discussions with them, and, and it's always kind of well you know how do we define cloud providers? How does the FFIEC provide, you know, define, you know, uh, cloud providers. And and we finally got that from the AIO. So I'm kind of happy about that. Bam. You know what I mean? They they are able to uh, help us with that. They did miss an opportunity uh, when it comes to two-factor authentication. Uh, one of the things that us as auditors, we, you know, we've, we've been believing for a while. And those of you who are audit clients, we might have had discussions with you about how uh, we feel that you should inventory all of your cloud assets in terms of do they offer MFA or not, and then monitor that. And try to make sure that our vendor owners, our, our system administrators, whoever that's responsible for configuring these cloud-based websites, uh, we want to make sure that they're, you know, uh, staying on top of MFA and bringing MFA, you know, uh, into the equation. Um, they really it, download this from the guidance and kind of take a look at this. This is really cool right here. They they kind of helped lay out, you know, where, and of course this is based on, you know, uh, you know the FFIC doesn't really make this up. They just compile what they think are good practices. Um, I believe this is out of one of the NIST guidances or the NIST publications, I should say. Uh, but suffice to say, this is where the rubber meets the road in terms of security. You know, we handle it all when we're on premises. Uh, we rely on, you know, the provider to hand some of it and, and then we, you know, uh, handle other parts. And that's really where we need to focus our, our auditing and make sure that we've got a good process in place when we deploy cloud assets. Uh, those shared responsibilities. Um, by the way, the essential characteristics that you'll read in there are from the Zero Trust uh, publication. But there's other stuff, there's service management. If you're large enough, and we do audit some banks that are large enough, you're gonna have to start having operational level agreements, which is like SLAs. Um, if you're a smaller, less complex entity, where you know the system administrator is the network administrator, is the ISO, uh, you don't need to set up agreements with, amongst yourselves, right? In, in your own, you know, I mean, uh, but the rest of us, if we've got segregated duties, that sort of thing, they're wanting us to establish operational level agreements. Uh, they talk about KPIs and continuous and improvement process. A lot of this is right out of management guidance. They just duplicated it in AIO. They talk about authorization boundaries, which is a really great concept that you should be digging into when you read the guidance. Um, it's going to be necessary for network access control, by the way. Um, and then we already, you know, mentioned that they they established those essential characteristics. Uh, that's directly out of the NIST publication, um, which I really don't want to take the time to go through. Um, this is an example, though, of how they're uh, uh, defining those uh, essential characteristics. So, in other words, this is what should be in place on those providers that you're calling a cloud provider. Now, do we need to audit them for that? That's one of the interpretations that, you know, I believe smaller banks aren't going to have to really worry about. The larger banks may. Finally, there's guidance on open source. Finally, there's guidance on shadow IT. Uh, both of them go a little bit beyond what a smaller community-based bank is going to want to do. 
Um, but at least now we have something that we can point to. We can use it to educate our management team, which is a really good opportunity that comes out of any new guidance, but especially this guidance. So we're gonna be talking about that in a few minutes here. Um, they've got better expectations for all these processes that we've been auditing ourselves on and having our auditors and our examiners you know, look at for, for years now, but they've finally established what they wanna see with change management, with end of life planning, uh, segregation of duties, you know, Infotex is, you know, we, we high-fived each other. Ah, finally, segregation of duties is spoke to in guidance somewhere. Um, the management booklet was disappointing in that. Uh, but then also they're, they're kind of catching up on MFA and, and file exchange, you know, secure messaging, BYOD, remote access, that sort of thing. Um, and they are trying to look ahead. Uh, zero trust, we already talked about, you know, artificial intelligence, machine learning, the internet of things are, are some of the emerging technologies that they're wanting us to consider uh, as we evolve our architecture. Um, then they made it easy for Infotex because the first thing we ever, we always do whenever there's a new guidance or an update to a guidance is we'll update our audit checklist, checklist or create a new audit checklist. And they've done that for us. That's Appendix A. It's the IT work program. It's what it's called. It's the questions that your examiners will choose from when they come in to audit you. Um, but what you need to realize is that this guidance has a lot of redundancy to the information security booklet, the BCM booklet that was you know, published in 2019, um, the management booklet. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, of stuff in that Appendix A that you've already been audited on up one side and down the other, right? And so we thought that it might be easier for for you and also for us because our, our audit clients don't want us to, you know, go over old ground if not if it's not necessary. And by the way, I would like to say that I mean I just gave a talk at the IBA Cyber Conference that established that one of the ways to heighten awareness is to go back and audit the older stuff, the stuff that we've been confident is working. Why not test that every once in a while? Why not test that confidence? So you could go ahead and audit your bank or have your auditor audit your bank or do an internal audit um, or an internal gap analysis, so to speak, on the entire Appendix A. But most of us are really busy and we just wanna know how it applies to us. Um, and so, this, this audit checklist is what we actually use it as. Um, we we kind of pitched it as a, as a gap analysis in a different forum that I'm at. And uh, we kind of discussed it in that forum and decided that really, if you called it the AIO risk assessment, when you present it to your auditors, to your examiners, it will help establish with your auditors and examiners what you used it for, which is to decide what doesn't rise to the level. And so if we can kind of go into that document there, what I'm talking about is that we've taken that uh, um, Appendix A, we've gone through it, removed everything that we think we're already auditing for and a few other things I'll get to in a minute here. And then we uh, give you the ability to mark whether or not you think it's in place at your bank. If it isn't, we've queued up risk rankings. You know, what, what kind of an impact would this have? What's the likelihood of this causing problems? Now from a compliance perspective, there's always a likelihood that anything in a compliance document is gonna cause problems. So we don't we, we removed compliance risk from the equation when we did uh, these risk rankings. You may or may not agree with that approach. And what we really strongly encourage with not only this boilerplate, but all of our boilerplates is that you customize this to your own bank. You know, your bank is very unique compared to what Infotex thinks the typical bank needs. But, what you can do when you're done then is now you've got a wrist, you know, uh, ranked, you know, I'm gonna take that first one out by filtering out the ones, right? And now we've got a wrist ranked list of to-dos. Um, a lot of stuff, by the way, you're already doing, uh, but we left it in there because there was a new part of it. Um, and so let's really get uh, to where uh, uh, I was heading with that. And so what I mean by that is that, um, uh, anything that we were 100% sure that we looked for in all audits, we took out. But if, well, you know, you gotta, you gotta sign up for the XYZ audit, which not all of our banks sign up for, we left that in. Um, then meanwhile, if it said larger institutions should, 
we took that out. Um, most of our clients are five billion and under. Um, and so we feel like larger institutions, at least in this guidance, applies to banks that are five billion or older or over. Um, and then, you know, if it addressed the controls for your mainframes, which I know some of you still have mainframes in place, or if it if it talks about APIs, or if it talks about system development lifecycle controls, or anything for banks that are designing their own systems, we've decided that the majority of our community-based bank clients are not writing their own internet banking software. And so we took that stuff out as well. Now, I have to say that I put some stuff in that the team then took out. Um, and there is still some things in here that, you know, like this one right here, I'm like, all right, you know, I, if you notice the risk ranking, the likelihood of this causing a problem for a typical community-based bank, I said is a one, the impact, you know, uh, I, we collectively said was a two, but then I put this one in there because if management is really doing this, they need better things to do because I can't see smaller community-based banks calling up their vendor and saying, hey, we want a list of all your open source applications and we want to know what kind of security issues there are with them. Really? Um, now, I can see Bank of America maybe doing that, but I just can't see, you know, uh, First Bank of Nowhere uh, doing that. So, so, but my team, I'm sure, took that out. Uh, when you download it, check and see if that's in there. Um, I'm hoping they took it out because that's Dan being sarcastic again. So, back to the deliverables, you know, we have that guidance in there. It's in the checklist folder. Um, then we have the cloud security and the segregation and the SIEM audit checklist. And again, it's at my.infotex.com slash October 21. When it comes to the actual architecture plan itself, what makes it different than what you're already doing with your strategic planning? And I haven't been auditing banks for about a year, year and a half uh, now, um, at least to the point where I'm looking at strategic plans. But when I was auditing banks, they usually would have their strategic plan maybe span three years, but then they were getting down to the details for the next year in a tactical plan. And, and that was totally sufficient. But how do we get to zero trust if we're only looking out, you know, this next year? And so to me, if there's an infrastructure train change that seems daunting, it's like, wow, you know, that's going to take more than, you know, a couple months or, you know, it's not, it's not like it's an audit finding. Um, although, you know, if you have an audit finding, you don't want to get to right away, you could use the architecture plan to spell out when you're going to get to it if you want to take some heat from the board. Uh, but suffice it to say, you see how this works is that, hey, you know, maybe for this next year, we're going to focus in on MFA for administrators. And then in 2023, we'll do MFA for everybody. And who knows, somewhere down the road, wouldn't it be great if we can actually be one of those banks? You know, Infotex actually has a couple clients uh, that are using, you know, two-factor authentication on everything or what we would call a passwordless network. You know, um, that would be a nice, you know, long-term vision, uh, gets your management team interested, and it gives us something to shoot for. So that's an example. I'm not saying this is what you would do in your bank. I'm just saying, hey, you know, that maybe this is what we can use it for. Network segmentation. Uh, to me, that's daunting, right? Um, a lot of our clients are just kind of like, well, we have a DMZ. You know what I mean? And and yes, let's let's at least set up a DMZ if that's if that makes sense. It doesn't have to be set up if it doesn't make sense. Uh, but if you have people, you know, uh, bringing in or not things in, maybe you segment off a network that they can connect to for their IoT devices. Or you know, if you're using voice over IP. Uh, but can you see how maybe this is the uh, you know this is the next year, and then somewhere down the road we're going to implement NAC, right? That's what all this is setting us up to do. Right. Or, or maybe not. I don't know. You know, it, it's your bank. Zero trust. <laughs> I mean, that's the reason I'm saying the architecture plan might be helpful for us because there's a lot that we can do to start heading towards zero trust, including this. I, I, I kind of um, uh, before I went up on vacation last week. So the last week before vacation was um, uh, the week after the conference. And I was kind of in my mind, making a list of how many people have I asked about zero trust and have said, yeah, that's wicked, you know, whatever. And I was like, have you read the publication yet? And they hadn't because it's huge, because it's kind of scary in terms of really, we're going to have to be doing this because it's so, there's no way in heck we're going to be doing this because it's like, you know, yeah, three years from now, it's going to be a lot different than it is now. I get the reasons to not read it. But man, I think it should be in your architecture plan that somebody gets their arms around where it is we're heading. 
because we need to populate this architecture plan with the rest of what needs to be done if we're gonna get from here to zero trust. And I don't remember if you remember this, or I don't know if you remember this, but the guidance itself spells out zero trust as something that needs to be considered, and then it points to the NIST publication. So if the guidance is pointing to the NIST publication, somebody in your bank needs to know what's in that publication. And then start discussing zero trust with management. It's not gonna be cheap. Management needs to understand it's the solution uh, to the fact that we used to have all of our cows in one pen, and then we just watched the pen. I'm using the Western theme here now for my metaphor. Uh, but now we've let all the cows and the horses out into the past year and we've got to watch them. I don't know. That metaphor really broke down quick. Um, but I like the castle versus the hotel metaphor. That's for sure. There's no moat around our network anymore. Our network is porous. Um, and so we're going to have to do some kind of a transition. And so maybe in 2023, maybe in 2022, we're just getting our arms around it. We're starting to talk to management about the fact that, hey, there's this zero trust thing. And I know a little bit more about it now at the end of 2022, because somewhere in 2022, I was able to get my arms completely around it. Um, but then maybe we're starting to map out the transition in 2023. Maybe we're implementing network segmentation and the rest of it so that by 2024, we're ready for NAC or whatever we decide is part of zero trust. What that could look like is, uh, well, you know, so what do you think Dan would use to, to, to spell that out? Well, I found a slide there. Um, a spreadsheet, of course. And so, of course, the, the, the columns will be wider. I kind of made them thinner. But this is actually, we, we use a document in our company called the yearly preview where, you know, right now we're, we're, we're this, the fourth quarter is finalized. And we're starting to decide what are we going to do first, second, third, fourth quarter of next year? What are we going to do in 2023, 24, 25, 26? So when, you know, we read about the architecture plan in our own mind, we're thinking, well, we'll just take the yearly preview and zero everything out and start putting our infrastructure changes that we already have in our technology plan in here. And then we realize, wow, and we're going to be able to look forward, you know, till 2026. That this year we're, you know, we always look for five years in our yearly preview. And so this is how it could look. I'm not sure if this is how it should look. This is just how it could look. Um, and, and by the way, I don't see a lot of categories here. I don't see a lot of items in here uh, for smaller community-based banks. It's just that the items that are in here are gonna be huge. They're gonna be big changes. Um, and so we're working on a deliverable. Um, I actually just talked to Brian about, you know, um, Brian's very instrumental in our deliverables. He has a different way of doing our yearly preview than this that gives really good metrics and that sort of thing. And so we're gonna get together and try to decide, you know, what, what can we present in the November webinar that would be a boilerplate for an architecture plan, as well as that policy language that I promised at the beginning of the webinar. So uh, what we wanna do now then is we wanna go ahead and uh, get the panelists kinda loosened up a little bit here. And if, if everybody can turn on their uh, uh, cameras, I'm actually gonna turn off my screen because from this point, we just wanna have a discussion about the, the, the guidance and what does this mean? You know, what's your initial reaction? Um, now I will have to say there's two people in this panel. If you look at the, you know, the 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 screen now, uh, who are a little more versed in the guidance than most people are, and that's Adam, our, our he's our lead non-technical auditor, um, and myself. Uh, but Regina and Chris and Mike, I I purposefully told you know don't prepare. I mean, know what you already know. You know, I mean, I did send them some questions. I'm going to ask questions like this, uh, but I did not want them. I wanted to know what their initial reaction to my presentation was. Um, and so, uh, you, as you can see on your screen there, uh, we have Regina Grady, uh, Chris Woodard, Michael Hartke, and Adam Reynolds with us uh, for our panel. And just by way of introduction, um, Regina, tell us where you're from. I'm with Home National Bank in Thorntown, based out of Thorntown, Indiana. Um, we're a two location bank that um, right now is asset side of, of 148 million right now, thanks to PPP. But um, I think that number will change uh, as of next year. So um, I assistant chief information officer. I assist with information security. 
and I'm the IT specialist for uh, both our locations. And um, it keeps you busy, as well as helping with operations when needed, um, training, policy procedure, touch a little bit of everything except loan administration. So we stay busy here. So the typical small bank wearing many hats. Um, are you the information security officer or you have somebody else doing that? I am not. I'm not. Um, Amy Jordan is our information security officer and we also have virtual um, information security officer in Jason Michelinius with VI. So nice, nice. So there is some segregation going on. You're good there. Yep. Uh, have you had a chance to read the AIO guidance? Not entirely. I, I read through a lot of the information you've put out. So um, that's been very helpful at this point in time. Um, we do actually have the OCC coming in in um, next month. So I'm curious to see what questions they add, what they have to say and do and things like that. So you anyway, and ask them questions about this. So I have a lot more reading on my schedule between now and then to um, you know, just be a little bit more versed in it as well, but not not had a lot of time to have they go further with it. I'm sorry. There's a little bit of a latency going on, so I'll be better at waiting until I know you're completely finished. I've got okay. a question though about have the OCC have they indicated they're even going to talk about this yet? They have not. Um, the pull list is very similar to what it's been in the past. Um, it's not more intense or anything like that, what it, what it has been. So we're curious to see if they just want to discuss it and see what we know about it, or um, since it's so new, or if um, they'll actually ask us some definitive questions about it. Now, um, when I worked really closely in, internally at your bank, I knew that the relationship with the examiners was really good to where yeah. Jeff would rally, come right out and say, hey, what do we need to do to get ready for this AIO thing? Are, are you planning to do that or? Uh, it's it's a question that I, I plan to bring up if they don't discuss it much. Um, that is that is on my, my target. Um, I'm not sure how much Jeff will be involved with the IT side of it this time. So, um, but yeah, but yeah, that's definitely a question that we're going to be bringing up if they don't uh, introduce that. Great, great. Well, um, you know, I, I I hope if you do ask them and, you know, whatever you can find out, because I have not been able to get a feel, you know, we have a, an examiner panel in a different venue coming up and, you know, I mean, and and they were kind of like, really, we have to be ready to talk about, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm you know, hoping that no nobody's going to be supervised this until middle of next year, you know, June 30th was when the guidance was published, so. But great. And then on a scale of one to 10, where do you think you are? How well versed are you on the guidance? Just to kind of help everybody, you know, know where you think you are in terms of understanding the guidance. Um, I'm usually conservative, so I'm going to say probably a two. So okay. as really early stages. Well, and, and just something, I feel like I'm at a five, but I, I felt like if I said that first, then, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, that would, but, but so good, good. Chris, where are you from? Hi, I am from Fahey Bank in Marion, Ohio, and I am the Vice President Security Officer. Our bank is 282 million, and we have three teller type branches, and then our operations center, and two, one lending office, and then one just management type office. So. Very good, and then. And then what's your role? I mean, I'm Vice President Security Officer. I take care of both information security and physical security. So I'm, I'm wearing the hat for both. Do you handle then the IT planning, you know, for the bank? Yeah, okay. yeah I handle the, uh, I oversee the IT steering committee. I, I pretty much count them as my persons that I report to, um, to keep them filled in. Um, of course, we have the, the systems administrator helps with that, but, uh, but yeah. And have you had a chance to read the guidance? Not until you sent it to me. <laughs> uh, did you actually get her out and read her there then? Or? I, I, I did. I, well, okay. I read what you sent me, and then I kind of skimmed through the FFIEC handbook yeah. piece. So. 
Got it. So, yeah. But you read that guidance summary then. The, the, I the, did. I did. I made notes in it and so forth. Good. Good. And so on a scale of one to 10, how versed are you, you know, knowing that Regina thinks she's at a two and I'll raise mine to a seven. Although I, I, yeah, I, you know, I'm going to say I'm probably right around a four, maybe leaning towards the five um, at this point. Okay, great. Michael, where are you from? As if I don't know. <laughs> I'm from a small startup company called Infotex. <laughs> Uh, I've been with Infotex for about 14 years now, um, uh, programming coordinator, and also a member of the uh, core IT uh, technical team and incident response team. Great. And just so everybody knows, I've got Michael on the panel because I'm hoping we'll have time to talk about end of life. It's, a, it's, it's something that all of us have been trying to work on end of life issues. The guidance is pretty particular. And, and, and we actually have end of life issues, of course, at Infotex. We have sensors in all of our clients that need to be updated and you know, we want our clients to pay for it. So end of life issues is stressful for us and everybody. Um, but, but I'm hoping that Mike can speak to that a little bit when, once we're done introducing everybody. Um, and so Adam, I'm sorry I painted a picture that you're well versed about the guidance, but I'm hoping you are just because you're our lead non-technical auditor, but give us the lowdown on, on Adam Reynolds. Sure. Um, the lead non-technical auditor uh, at Infotex. Um, so this is, this guidance is really right up my alley. I've uh, been with Infotex for about, uh, say, approaching eight years now and uh, from Dayton, Ohio. Right. And then um, have you had a chance to read the guidance? I have. Um, gone through it a couple times since it's released. I've uh, been a bit busy with other things, as you can imagine, in 2021. Um, so not as versed in it as I would like to be, um, but you know, we're kind of still in that stage, so getting there. So on a scale of one to 10, how versed are you? Oh, it might be a conservative estimate, but I'd say four, um, well, probably you, higher than that though. If you're a four, then I'm a three and a half. Well, I, then, well yeah. <laughs> makes me a one. Yeah, well, yeah that's, <laughs> but anyway, okay, okay, Adam's, Adam's very, uh, you know, he's a, he's a non-technical auditor. You, um, so, uh, very conservative. I love that. He's, he's the guy that takes our audit risk for us. So I like that. Well, anyway, um, then what I'd like then the first, you know, first question really, um, Regina, I'm going to direct it towards you, but talk to us about how you go about technology planning as is now, you know, without the impact of the AIO guidance. Um, we have a technology steering team, and um, we pretty much um, follow the guidance there. Tracking um, end of life, we've tried to put in a rotation for devices so that we don't have to worry about end of life that we're replacing before we start having problems and um, issues for um, those things. We do um, update our plan, like you know, every one, every year it gets updated and submitted to the board as well. Management does have input um, when they want a, um, you know, when they're looking for something new, um, they, it usually gets, you know, thrown over to us and gets added to the plan um, when they come up with it. So we try to um, keep them in the loop as much as possible, but definitely every year that, uh, that annual review is going to them and that plan is going to them. Um, let me ask you this, uh, is, is, can you describe the, the, the contents of a typical technology? I know it changes from year to year, but I mean, is they have high level strategy and then low level tactical plan or how, how is it organized? Um, it is high level strategy. And then um, if there's going to be um, replacement needed, then it goes into more detail um, into that piece of it um, so that they're um, aware uh, obviously for like additional budgetary needs and things like that. So um, the original, the first, the most part of it is at a high level um, because it's ever changing for us. Just, you know, we, um, we know our general plan that we have, but um, as things come and go, we you have to tweak it throughout the year as well too. So we try not to get too drilled down specific so that if something happens and we're not able to implement something, um, in the time frame that we wanted to, then we have some leeway there. How far out does it go? 
how many does it go out? Uh, one year, two years, three years? All depends. Um, we do have we do have some general breakdowns going out past the the next year. So I believe it's it's either three or five is the next. I think it's three and five, and um, that's about as far as it goes out is into the five year plan. Okay. Um, Chris, I have more questions for you, Regina, but I, I, I would like to, you know, have Chris answer kind of the same question I just asked. But so tell me about your technology processing uh, or, you know, technology planning, I should say, um, at Fahey Bank. Well, our, our technology plan generally goes out for a year. Um, the IT department takes a look at the bank wide plan. And then we try to create our IT plan to supplement and support the, uh, the bank-wide plan. Um, the first year, we go into more detail. And then for the second and third years, um, it's it just more or less line items, no details that go with them. And then we have what we call, I, I keep an action plan for our IT steering committee of the things that we want to accomplish for the year. And um, we report on those every time we have a meeting on where we're at with those. And towards the end of the year, we know if there's something that has to be bumped to the next year. Because, you know, it's never set in stone. There's always going to be something that pops up that's going to push something out or uh, at least delay it a little bit. So, and, and then once it's created, we present it to our IT steering committee. And then once they accept it, then we move it on to the board for approval. And then is it, is it like Regina's where it kind of becomes a budgetary document as well? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Yep. Most of our I, most of our IT budget comes from that plan. And so your CFO is able to see, oh, wow, you know, next year to year after we've got these big expenses or, you know, because you're going to be aware of the big ones, right? So Right. Yes. Um, uh, Regina, what are the takeaways? But why do you like the fact that you do a technology plan every year at the bank. What, what's the what's the good things about technology planning? Um, it, it gives us a general idea, um, keeps management kind of on board of what we need um, and the board of directors, of course, because um, they're not always um, really versed on what we need to do to keep up. And um, so that for us, is the easiest that's the best communication we can say at least we can warn them ahead of time and let them know why those changes are occurring you know why why we have that in place um it also helps me know that you know you know we've got projects going all the time so uh it helps with planning on those things and get this to know what's um it, it looking forward for that that next year likewise with you chris yeah um we also keep pretty tight with the project management committee because face it, there's not a whole lot that you do that doesn't touch IT. I, I, I mean, even the simplest things are gonna touch IT in some fashion. So so yeah, but very similar to, to Regina. Nice, and then um, I guess this is the, you know, this is the big question, but what do you see, what do you think might change? And I've got some drill downs if you if you don't see anything. Uh, but what do you see might change now that there's this new guidance? You know, when when you when you go, you might do it th not do it this year. You might do it this year. But when you go to apply, I've learned this from the AIO. What's your initial reaction? What do you already know is probably going to change? Anything, Regina? Um, we we are already looking at um, actually we're implementing MFA now right now for IT um, administrators so we we are rolling that out already we know that's that's what they're looking for and it's going to have to become a piece of it um, not really knowing for sure what we're going to do for um, multi-factor for general users um, but we've also turned on controls we you know you you guys do our steam and monitoring for us so. We've turned our controls and any new accounts that are created, we now get a notification immediately um, by phone call to make sure that it's created because we have so few user changes. Um, so we, we've turned that on just to have that added layer of security. Um, but yeah, just knowing, just reviewing the structure of how we want things to go from here and um, you know, zero trust, 
just really baffles me. <laughs> so, um, mm -hmm. knowing our, our staffing and, um, how they handle what they have to do now. So, um, yeah, and, we're, and more things are going to the cloud. So we're, we're just having to look forward to more multi-factor um, instances and things like that. So just as, as different systems change, we're trying to implement just as quickly as we can. Chris? Uh, you know, as far as changes for us at this point, um, as I was reading that, a lot of that, I think we're, we're pretty much already doing um, do we have a full-fledged written architecture plan? No, but I think with, I, I just feel that a lot of it we're, we've already got in place or we're already looking at putting it into place. Like Regina was saying with the multi-factor authentication, we've added it to different pieces. We're looking at it to add to the systems administrator. Um, whether it goes out to all users will depend on where's our network going to be at that point when, when we when we finally get to that point of wanting to add that is it going to be here at the bank is it going to be cloud-based um there's there's a lot of big things that we're, we're looking at right now and i think now is probably a really great time for me to get that that plan actually on paper because there is a lot of change coming for Fahey bank well and to be able to look further out you know what i'm hearing you both mm -hmm. say what i'm I just like to reflect on the fact that to me, the two of you are talking more about a process, not a document. And, and right. I and I feel like that's sure. that's sure. you know to me, I'm like, what kind of how can we help our clients with a boilerplate, right? But but I feel like what you're basically saying is that hey, we're going to integrate moving to the cloud, moving to the virtual environment, multi-factor authentication. Uh, Mike, I'm kind of going to cue you up here, but end of life planning. Uh, I don't know about, you know, the banks, uh, Regina and Chris, but Michael, we have an end of life uh, planning uh, issue. Can you like shed some light on that? Sure. <clears throat> so not only, you know, do we have the same end of life planning concerns that, you know, traditional bank infrastructure would have, uh, but as Dan alluded to earlier, you know, we have hundreds of, of sensors which are running dozens of applications and, you know, everything has an end of life. Uh, hardware, software, you know, these cloud services, everything has an end of life. So, you know, it's funny because we've kind of uh, ad hoc uh, end, of, uh, end of life uh, monitoring and mitigation uh, for years, but I feel like the AIO really kind of spells out exactly what you need to do um, and I think there's some things that we're not doing uh, currently. And, you know, we're just happen to be, we're happen to be in a situation where, you know, a lot of things are going end of life currently or quickly or soon. Um, so it's a, a big concern for us. And, you know, we have to get, you know, those paper trails, those risk, uh, you know, to the um, uh, uh, risk rankings and, you know, take a look at all that stuff. and and make sure that you know we're doing it right um and the funny thing is uh i'll just i'm gonna i know we don't have a lot of time but thinking back to my early days in, in it you know it's funny that we we knew end of life was here uh when you know the system stopped working <laughs> you know or they stopped supporting when windows nt or windows 98 so and it's totally different today totally different yeah, when your when your auditor started saying, "Hey, you got Windows 98 boxes on the network still," that was the end of life planning back in the early days. Um, very good, Mike. Um, I will say um, it's funny because I've been so uh, kind of deep, you know, knee deep in my own our own end of life issues. But I've been wondering, you know, Adam, as as an auditor, uh, how do you ha uh, plan? Uh, how do you help? you know, our banking clients comply or how do you plan plan to help them comply with the EOL provisions of the guidance? I was, I've been thinking about that. So I would say a lot of it's already being done. Um, you know, just ensuring that there is a documented plan and process mm -hmm. um, to identify assets and end of life timeframes. Um, often that's really just a spreadsheet, um, you know, again, uh, documenting, like as you've mentioned, you know, not just hardware, uh, but software and, you know, now more cloud assets and websites. So, 
you know, really it's just ensuring that there's a documented plan and process to identify assets uh, and end of life timeframes. Um, deployment dates I feel are also important to track, but are really not mentioned. Um, and that end of life is included in strategic planning. Uh, and then again, ensuring all assets are in the asset inventory, software, hardware, cloud assets and websites, uh, but also that there is a plan to replace assets uh, nearing end of life uh, or possibly a plan to maintain viability and security beyond end of life if necessary. So are you seeing them kind of have this information as like a patch management, kind of like their pass, patch management uh, process where they just have a spreadsheet with all that information and tracking end of life? Uh, I would say yes. Yeah, typically a single spreadsheet, but you know, normally multiple tabs um, for different system uh, types and things like that, phone systems versus you know actual PCs and endpoints. But um, yeah, uh, spreadsheets really the way I see it uh, pretty much <laughs> all the time. I'd say. Uh, I mean, I'd, I'm sure there's you know applications that yeah. can track these for them and things like that. But um, I don't, I don't, I don't feel you can really beat a spreadsheet for this. <laughs> Sweet, thanks, man. In the interest of time, I'd like to steer. There's one last issue that we didn't bring up much. Uh, we talked about MFA, we talked about NAC, we talked about zero trust, we talked about end of life. I searched for the word shadow, <laughs> but we never really talked about shadow IT, which I am so glad has been addressed in this guidance. And so, Regina, how will you monitor for and prevent unapproved software from being installed on your network? Um, that, that is definitely um, something that I'm I'm researching and looking more into um, to get better for us to get better at. Um, obviously, we have you know managed service providers and MSSP and you guys, and um, so we you know we rely on those sources that you know things aren't you know the bad things are not being installed when they shouldn't be. Um, Currently, it's workstation it's workstation checks that I'm going around and physically doing workstation checks. So that is part of the plan, though, that we're trying to just work out and see how we can improve that. Um, you know, when you have an external audit and you get the vulnerability findings and you say, like, well, where'd that come from? You know, so yeah, it is. Um, you know, it is definitely um, a plan that we're our strategy we're looking into more just to see what we can better do to improve that. Great, Regina. And Chris, I just realized by going to you last every time, you always got to come up with something that Regina hasn't already said. So <laughs> here's your opportunity. That's okay. IT. Not a problem. Um, we actually have software that we have installed that, that monitors our entire network. And if something new is added, then there's a group of us who actually get an email that, that basically flags it and lets us know that something unexpected has attempted to join the network or has scanned the network in some way. Um, we're also looking at installing a new theme so that will also help in pulling a lot of this data together instead of having to go to you know two or three different places to pull the different data. But and then we get a report also from this software on a weekly basis that I can look at to say, you know, okay, we've added it, it tells me I've added this this many new PCs. Um, I can verify with our systems administrator how many new PCs did you add to the system this past week. Um, same thing with software updates. If uh, we get a new software that's installed, um, we're, go we're going to get notified of it from, from one of the systems. So, Great. And we use all of that to pull it all together, to keep us a, you know, a current picture where our network stands. Very good. I will say, Go ahead, Mike. I will say the, the, the things that scare me are uh, cloud-based, you know, like even yeah. as innocuous as, you know, Dropbox. Yeah, um, and then, uh, you know, phones. I think a lot of us uh, are locking our phones down now, but, you know, there's some pretty shady stuff on like the Android app store and stuff. So those are the things that really scare me. Mm -hmm. Adam, how are you I, gonna help clients address their shadow IT issues? What are you gonna be looking for? Let me unmute myself. 
Um, really a combination of everything that's kind of really been talked about. Uh, you know, how are they identifying uh, new systems, you know, when they're added to their network? Um, how can they identify new programs, you know, if they're installed when they shouldn't be? Um, so really, yeah, just trying to, you know, understand how they would track these changes uh, and seeing, you know, of course, if we can offer any uh, suggestions, um, you know, on how to improve that process. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, I just wanted to clarify one thing real quick or just add to it, um, because, again, as uh, you know, discussed, you know, there, typically there's always or already um, some sort of plan implemented to, you know, find new systems added to the network or software. Um, but really going into Mike, uh, one of Michael's concerns, uh, really what's new is just identifying and uh, inventorying cloud assets. That's really something uh, that really needs to be done you know, going forward as you know, we're just implementing more cloud assets. Um, so yeah, it's definitely a threat out there uh, and one of the bigger parts, uh, or bigger changes I would say uh, in this guidance update. Well, and, and I mean, you can use, you know, you got content filters, your seam provides a list of, you know, all the cloud assets that people have gone to. It's just somebody's got to go through it and say, hey, have we approved that, right? Um, and if not, you know, let's talk to management. One of, one of the things I love about new guidance is that it's our opportunity to recircle back around and help management understand what we're facing. And unfortunately, shadow IT is caused more by management than it is the bad guys in banks, at least. Um, am I right about that, Regina and Chris? Is that still kind of, while well, we're on a movie, maybe you don't want to say that on a movie. So we'll, we'll, we'll let you escape without answering that question. But uh, before the term shadow IT was coined, and I love the term because it helps management understand what they're doing, but we used to call it rogue technology acquisitions, right? As you know, a management team member going out, they're just trying to help their customers. They use Dropbox. Next thing you know, we have really you know confidential information in what used to be a very insecure place. Uh, I don't know if it is anymore. Um, and then, you know, and then we get audit findings, we get this, we get that. So, so I'm glad the guidance finally spoke to that. Well, hey, we actually made it through all the questions I wanted to ask. I really, really appreciate both of your, you know, help. And of course, Adam and Mike, I always appreciate everything you guys do. Uh, but Regina and Chris, thank you very much for joining us, especially as busy as everybody is. Um, I really appreciate you taking some time out to read all the stuff we sent to you, you know, I mean, that sort of thing. So thank you very much. Um, Sophia, we can't let the webinar go without thanking Sophia for all the great graphics that she does. Brian, producing this with everything else you got going on, I really appreciate that. And then Michael and Adam, you know, Adam was told he was going to be on this panel. What was that, yesterday? Um, I, I, I think it was yesterday. <laughs> So thank you very much, Adam. We really appreciate that. And, and Michael, of course, I always appreciate everything you do. Uh, the curator of the code, the envoys from the scene. Uh, but I do believe that we have uh, uh, completed what I wanted to accomplish with our webinar here today. When you view an Infotex webinar or movie, you do so with four caveats. First, you are agreeing to the terms posted at the webpage listed on this slide. Second, our lawyers want you to know that what Infotex presents is often time dated or about new trends, regulations, or guidance, and therefore we cannot provide this material with any warranty whatsoever. Thirdly, material provided with Infotex webinars and movies is copyrighted. You keep the copyright to material customized to your organization, but Infotex reserves the right to use the material in other engagements and boilerplates. See our transfer of copyright agreement at the webpage listed in the slide. Finally, those who view our webinars or movies may be added to an email mailing list. If you do not wish to receive notice of additional educational opportunities, Please accept our apologies and please opt out at the web page shown on the slide.